International Missions in Massachusetts, and uh, we were chatting in 1733. The Great in Massachusetts has a long history here in Boston, and we were chatting by the Grand Lodge of England, uh, who was established in 1717. And we have the third oldest in the world and the first oldest Grand Lodge in the Western Hemisphere. It's a pleasure to be really proceeding. I'm going to read some excerpts from Paul Gideon's letter to Jeremy Beltman. Dear Sir, having a little leisure, I wish to fulfill my promise of giving you some facts and anecdotes prior to the Battle of Lexington, which I do not remember seeing in any history of the American Revolution. In the winter, toward the spring, we frequently took turns, two and two, to watch the soldiers by patrolling the streets all night. The sunny night preceding the 19th of April, about 12 o'clock at night, the boats belonging to the transports were all launched and carried into the sterns of the men of war. They had previously been hauled up in the air. We, likewise, found that the grenadiers and the light infantry were all taking our food. From these moments, we expected something serious was about to be transacted. On Tuesday evening, the 18th, it was observed that a number of soldiers were marching toward the bottom of the commons. About 10 o'clock at night, Dr. Warren sent in great haste for me and Ben, that I immediately set off for Lexington, where Mr. Hancock and Adams were and to appoint them of the moment, and that I was thought that they were the objects. When I got to Dr. Warren's house, I found that he had sent an express by land to Lexington, a Mr. William Dodds. The Sunday before, I desire Dr. Warren. I had been to Lexington to the visitors, Hancock and Adams, who were at the river, Mr. Clark's. I returned at night to Charlestown. There, I agreed with Colonel Conant and some other gentlemen that if the British went out by water, we would show two lands in the north church steeple. And if by land, one as a signal. For if we were apprehensive, it would be difficult to cross the Child River or get over to Boston Neck. I left Dr. Warren's, called upon a friend, and desired him to make the signals. I then went home, took my boots, and sure enough, and went to the north part of town where I kept my boat. Two friends rode me across the Charles River, a little eastward where the Somerset of War lies. It was then the young flight of the ship that was winding and the moon was rising. They landed me on the Charlestown side, and when I got into town, I met Colonel Cronin and several others. They said they had seen our signals. I told them what was acting and went to get me a horse. I got a horse of Deacon Mark. When the horse was preparing, Richard Devins, Esquire, was one of the committee of safety, came to me and told me that he'd come down the road for license. After sundown that evening, he met ten British soldiers, all well mounted and armed, going up the road. Thus, sir, I have endeavored to give you a short detail of some of the matters of which perhaps no person but myself had documents or knowledge. I have mentioned some of the names which you are acquainted with. I wish you would ask them if they can remember the circumstances I allude to. I am, sir, 
with every son of every state, you are a humble servant, all we bear. Stairs with stealthy 
bread to the belfry chamber overhead, startled with visions from their perch on the somber laughters that round him made masses and moving shapes of shade. By the trembling ladder, steep and tall to the highest window in the wall, where he paused to listen and look down a moment on the roofs of the town, the moonlight flowing over all. Beneath, in the churchyard, lay the dead, and a night captain on the hill, wrapped in silence so deep and still, that even here, like the sentinels tread, the watchful night wind as it went, creeping along from tent to tent, and seeming to whisper, all is well. A moment only he feels the spell of the place and the hour and the secret dread, of the lonely belfry and the dead. For suddenly all his thoughts are bent on a shadowy something far away where the river widens to meet the bay, a line of black that bends and floats on the rising tide like a bridge of boats. Meanwhile, impatient to mount and ride, booted and spurred with a heavy stride on the opposite shore, walk Paul Revere. Now he patted his horse's side. Now he gazed on the landscape far and near. Then impetuous, stamped the earth and turned and tightened the saddle girth. But mostly he watched with eager search the belfry tower of the old North Church. As it rose above the graves on the hill, lonely and spectral and somber and still and low, as he looks on the belfry's height, a glimmer. Then, a gleam of light, he springs to the saddle, the bridle he turns, but lingers and gazes, till full on his sight, a second lamp in the belfry burns. A hurry of who's in the village street is shaken the moonlight, a bulk in the dark, and beneath from the pebbles and passing a spark, struck out by a steed that flies fearless and fight and beat. That was all, and yet the gloom and the light the fate of a nation was riding that night. And the spark struck out by that seed in his flight kindled the land into flame with its heat. He has left the village and out to the sea, and beneath him, tranquil and broad and deep, is the mystic, meeting the ocean eyes, and under the altars, the skirt is edged, now soft on the sand, now loud on the ledge, is heard the tramp of his steed as he rides. It was twelve by the village clock when he crossed the bridge into Medford town. He heard the crowing of the cock and the barking of the farmer's dog, and felt the damp of the river fog that rises when the sun goes down. It was one by the village clock when he galloped into Lexington. He saw the gilded weathercock swim in the moonlight as he passed, and the meeting house windows, light and bare, gaze at him with spectral glare, as if they already stood aghast at the bloody work they would look upon. It was two by the village clock when he came to bridge and Concord town. He heard the bleeding of the clock and the twitter of birds among the trees, and felt the breath of the morning breeze blowing over the meadow's ground. And one was safe and asleep in his bed, who at the bridge would be first to fall? Who that day would be lying dead, pierced by a British musket ball? You know the rest in the books you have read, how the British regulars fired and fled, how the farmers gave them all for ball, from behind each fence and front yard wall, chasing the redcoats down the lane, then crossing the fields to emerge again, under the trees at the turn of the road, and only pausing to fire and load. So through the night goes Paul Revere, and so through the night went his cry of alarm to every Middlesex village and farm, a cry of defiance and not of fear, a voice in the darkness, a knock at the door, and a word that shall echo forevermore. For born on the night wind of the past, through all our history to the last, in the hour of darkness and peril and need, the people will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed and the midnight message of all relief.